Bible in the pew, it'll be page 841. As we go to Isaiah chapter 18 tonight, I have been challenged and encouraged uh, by our series in Isaiah. If you know how long the book of Isaiah is, you know that we're not even halfway done yet, uh, but that's okay here because uh, we ought to be in Isaiah, and the Bible has challenged uh, as a pastor to preach the whole counsel of God. Now, does that mean we'll ever get to Leviticus? Well, perhaps, all right? But you have a few more chapters of Isaiah before we have to make that decision next. Uh, But Isaiah is just chock full of wonderful truths about God. Paul says to Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means when you're reading in Chronicles, it's profitable. When you're in Proverbs, it's profitable. James, Leviticus, Genesis, Hosea, every bit of it is profitable. Then Paul goes on to explain a few ways that the Word of God is profitable in. And the first word that he uses is the word that we have in our Bible, the word doctrine. In its essence, in its rudimentary form, means teaching, instruction. The Bible contains so much instruction. The Bible teaches me about life and the purpose and the value of life. The Bible teaches me about finances and and how to structure my finances. The Bible teaches me about a husband and a wife and a son and daughter and what that relationship should look like. But fundamentally, the Bible brings me instruction about God. Without the Bible, I would not know who this God is who created the universe. Please understand that the word God is not the name of God. It's a description of deity. Many religions will have a God. We serve the true God, the true deity. And the Bible begins with these words, in the beginning, deity. God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible answers that question where we came from and what happened. And then in the book uh, uh, of the Bible, the Bible then begins to describe God and names God for us. Apart from the Bible, we would not know his name. We don't find his name in nature. We find it in the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. They, They describe his majesty and his power. But the Bible describes God in just beautiful fashion. Tonight, in your mind's eye, I would like you, in your mind's eye, to begin a description of God. Perhaps, in your mind, you will begin with love, compassion, or mercy, perhaps forgiveness. Because of some of the, some of the songs tonight, perhaps even your mind will then begin to describe the beauty found in the cross. And the power and glory revealed in the resurrection. But if I were to ask a further question, but describe God to me, how would you answer that question? What would your answer sound like? What would your God look like? How we view God How we understand God will influence, even determine, how we live. If we view God to be a paternal grandfather, then we will live as we view a paternal grandfather would treat us. I remember when Johnny was very, very young, my parents' very first grandchild. Remember one night there on Airport Road, we're sitting there in the living room, Brother Treadway, and uh, Johnny was running around. And as a father, I thought perhaps even a good father, I said, Johnny, you need to settle down and sit down. Something that all dads and moms, babysitters have said alike. Settle down. I remember my mother putting her hand on my leg. I said, J.D., he just needs a sucker. And my mom is not here tonight. I would say this story if she were right here. I've told her this story. She went to see my sister in Colorado. I remember looking at that woman who was sitting next to me. That was not my mother. And I said, Mom, what has happened to you? You would have wailed on me. And her response, oh, J.D., just out of my house. Get out of my house. 
depart from me, you worker of iniquity. But if we view God to be a motherly grandmother or a paternal grandfather, we will live that way. If we view God to be like a police officer who is hiding in that speed trap on I-75 right behind the overpass, that when you come up to it, you kind of look, is he, did, did he see that? Then we'll live that way. We'll glance over our shoulders. Did God see that? Did he see that? How we view God will determine, influence how we live. The next portion of, of Scripture tonight in the next few weeks, Isaiah chapter 18 through a few more chapters, which I may not all preach individually. I'll take Isaiah 18 tonight, but I may not preach them all separately. We will discover some other aspects of God's character. We find this passage, they have been called the burdens, all right? It is doom and gloom sometimes. It is judgment. It is not all happiness. Though the Bible has plenty of happiness and joy in it, this is not one of those passages at first glance. But in these passages, we will discover other aspects and characteristics of God that God wanted us to know about him. This was not man's idea. This was God's idea. We will discover in these passages tonight and, and following weeks some attributes, some cultures, some ideas, and some humanistic philosophies that God is absolutely against. When we speak of things that God is against, understand that this is not popular in culture. It is anti-culture. Culture wants to tolerate everything but Jehovah. If you saw some of the Olympic opening ceremony, then you saw that it was perfectly acceptable for the world to mock a holy and a glorious God. If they had done that same thing to the God that the Muslims worship, you can imagine the outrage and the uproar. But it's fine to mock the God of the Bible. Culture says we tolerate everything except those who follow truth from Jesus Christ. And one thing that prophecy in the Bible does for us is to reveal God to us. We will see characteristics and begin to understand some things of what God is for and against. This is not only anti-culture, it is against some Christian's personality to emphasize just one aspect, one set of character traits of God. God's love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness are no less important than his holiness. And that is and it's judgment. You see, there is a hell, and there's also a heaven. There is a blessing and a curse for those who follow God and those who go against God. Upon further review, you'd see that even these topics and these things are not the way to grow your church. Not many progressive churches on a Sunday morning will tout, come to First Baptist Church or come to this church and we're going to study the prophecy from Isaiah 18. Instead, they will find some culturally relevant idea. A few years back when Star Wars had just hit mainstream, the, the whole series at a church was about the force. My friends, that's not in the Word of God. All right? And you may, you may have a crowd, but you're not going to have Christ. But though this is anti-culture and anti-personality and anti-church growth, all right, it is pro-God. It is pro-His character, His description. And remember in Isaiah that God is way up here, we are way down here, and God in these passages will, will help us to understand the God up here as he reveals to us himself. Imagine tonight someone were to ask me, Brother Howell, would you describe your wife Doreen to us? Maybe I would begin with a five foot four or so blonde hair, 
beautifully attractive? Is that live stream right? That's okay. Just clip that right there, buddy. Yep, there we go. Upstairs, down. Okay, I'm done. All right, let's have an invitation. That's enough. But if they said, well, well, you described how she looks, but, but what is her personality like? Say she's vibrant, outgoing, and, and so friendly. But then maybe you answer this question, well, what does she like? Well, me, obviously. <laughs> it's not obvious? I, mean, I thought it was. <laughs> Let's say, well, she loves her God. She loves her family. She loves her dogs. She loves her food. But then if you asked Brother Howell, what doesn't she like? Well, I don't know. You don't know? Well, I don't ever really worry about that too much. I find it doesn't help a marriage to know what your wife doesn't like. Yes or no, folks? Yes or no? It's it's, saying, Brother Howell, let me help you. Right? Let me help you. You might maybe want to sort of kind of find out some things that she doesn't like, just so you can avoid those. Well, listen, I think you're too negative. I think you're just trying to focus on the the negative characteristics and the negative attributes and all those negative things. I just don't like that. I want to focus on her love and her compassion and her love for these other things. You would not walk away saying, wow, that's going to be a very fulfilling marriage. You're going to walk away saying like, you know what? He's in for a world of hurt and surprise. Poor Doreen. And so for us to ignore some of these things about God would be at our own peril. And so tonight, last one was blessing, we'll look at chapter 18 of Isaiah, shorter chapter, and it'll give you three characteristics from this chapter about God. Lord, I ask for your help tonight. Lord, as we read your word and, and look at some of these truths, I ask you would illuminate your character to us. Lord, we're embarking on a a spiritual journey tonight, Lord. This is not just for our minds, Lord, but this is for our soul. Lord, we want to know you. We want to know about you. And Lord, we want to understand in as limited way as as our feeble minds can everything you've revealed to us in your word. And so, Lord, tonight, help us. Lord, take this passage and illuminate it in our hearts through your spirit. And Lord, I pray you touch us tonight in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 18, Woe to the land is shadowing with wings, which is beyond the river of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation, scattered and peeled to a people terrible from the beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye, When he lifted up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For afore the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches." They shall be left together under the fowls of the mountains and to the beasts of the earth, and the fowls shall summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion." One could read this passage in just a few moments like I did. One could easily just turn the page in their Bible and say, you know what, that was quite a read. And I saw some words I recognized. I saw a couple concepts I put together. But beyond that, I'm glad to go to Isaiah 19. And in doing so, I believe we'd miss just some truths, some characteristics about God that God purposefully, that God intentionally gave us. This is not just a random prophecy. This is not just a page filler in the Old Testament. This is the very intention, the very heartbeat of God for us in Isaiah to know more about God and more about his characteristics, though we know precious else about what happens in this passage. I want you to notice three truths tonight. 
You may, if you're writing your Bible, just highlight, or not highlight, but, but walk around some verses there. So when you come back to this in your Bible reading, you can remember, and you don't just skip over this passage. Why don't you notice this first truth? That the God of heaven is not distracted. The God of heaven is not distracted. When we look at verse number one, the other chapters that we come to prophecy in Isaiah will often start with a specific name, the, the burden of Egypt, the burden of Moab, to the children of Israel. But here in this passage, we do not have a name, but we have a description. Verses uh, 1 and 2, we see this description, Woe to the land, shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. That sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation, scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from the beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. And though the nation is not specifically named, there's a description here. And even in this, in this description, scholars do not know exactly whom this is referring to. There's some idea that it could be Ethiopia because Ethiopia is mentioned, but it gives the idea past that. It has the words shadowing of wings, and some uh, said that that's, that's Egypt because of the way they would use their music and the wings of symbols would do certain things, and so it could be, it could be Egypt. It could be Ethiopia. Some have even uh, said that perhaps it's the children of Israel in, in a far way. And though we don't know exactly whom it is, we do know some definite details about this people. Verse number two, they send ambassadors by the sea. God in his providence, God in his, in his glory above the earth has noticed that this nation, who is going to receive some judgment, send, sends the people out on boats to other nations, and the, and the ambassadors of the sea has the idea that they're going all over the place to set up alliances. And they go over here to this nation and set up an alliance. And they go over here and set up an alliance. And over here and set up an alliance. And God has observed this people who are using the sea, the water, to send ambassadors out. Because God is not distracted. If, if it was Egypt, it would appear that God was disconnected and distracted because they were just running over people. They were just destroying nations and gobbling them up. And it would appear that God is distracted because nothing is happening. And a pagan culture and false gods are receiving glory that is due God. And yet God is not distracted. He is noticing exactly what is going on. He further describes these people and he says this, they are scattered and appealed. Two descriptive words as we look at these words. Number one, the word scattered means drawn out, smooth. It could be sharp like a point. It could be that they were a very, uh, uh, they were a very aggressive driven nature, nation. Or it could even mean, this word has, can mean idea of smooth, that they just shaved their heads and they were very smooth. And there were some cultures that would shave their heads and shave their bodies. But God is not distracted. He sees all these things. Further, that word, uh, that word peeled does not mean like a banana or a potato, but has the idea that they were independent and stubborn. And right there, we begin to understand the heartbeat of God. Because you know what God has always been against? Stubbornness. You know what stubbornness reveals? pride. From the first pages of scripture, there was stubbornness described by the serpent to Eve, displayed in Eve's actions and choices, followed by, Adam, by Adam's, the stubbornness of, I will do things my own way, I will not do things God's way. God is against stubbornness, and God is against independence. You see, the life of a Christian, the life of a believer, the life of a child of God is contrary to human life. In human life, and I see, uh, I see Brother Kyle and Marcella, and I saw Phoenix tonight, right? Phoenix is growing, and he's walking, and he's becoming more independent. I can observe that, right? As all parents do with their children. And, and partially, we embrace that independence, all right? Your intent is at some point 
to see Phoenix live a, a, a healthy as a citizen and a child of God and, you know, in a marriage and somewhere else, now just living in your basement the rest of his life. But a child who becomes independent, all right, though that may be natural for a human, it is contrary to, to the word of God. Because as a child of God, I must go from independence to dependence. I must leave my own way and my own stubbornness and my own obstinance and say, God, I embrace your way. And my, my friend, remember this, that God is always against stubbornness. And here, God is not distracted. Not only is the location detailed, their description is detailed, but his judgment is detailed. We find that, that what will happen, they were meted out and trodden down whose land the rivers have spoiled. We see that twice in this passage. I want you tonight from this first point just to remember that God is omniscient. To those who are against God, God is not distracted. He sees everything. He observes all things. He is not caught unaware. He is not ambivalent to what is going on in the USA in 2024. He is not disconnected from what happens in this church or in this city or in this world or among God's people. And to learn and to understand and to contemplate, to rejoice and to fear the God, to serve the God, to love the God that sees it all. It was in Russia years ago. There was a time when there was petty theft in Russia. And they're happening, as the story goes, in the factories of Russia. To curtail this thievery that was going on, the sin that was going on, the factories asked for guards for security around the factories. One evening, out of one factory came Peter Petrovich, wheeling a wheelbarrow, and in that wheelbarrow was a lumpy bag. The guard was instantly suspicious. And he says, all right, Petrovich, the guard said, what have you got in there? And he said, oh, just some sawdust and shavings to help light a fire at home. The guard was not easily deceived. He said, I don't believe that for a second. So he tore open the bag, and much to his surprise, in the bag was just sawdust and shavings for Peter Petrovich to take to his house to light a fire. Next night, a similar occurrence happened. Peter walks out, he's wheeling a wheelbarrow, a lumpy bag. The guard said, okay, Peter Petrovich, tonight, what's in the bag? Just some sawdust and shavings. I don't believe you. Tore open the bag again, and Sure enough, just sawdust and shavings. This went on for a while. The guard always feeling that Peter was one step ahead of him until one night Peter comes out. He said, okay, Peter, this now is just between you and me. What in the world are you stealing? I know that you are stealing something. I won't report you, but just tell me what it is. He said, it's simple. I'm stealing wheelbarrows. And my friends, don't miss this, that God is not that easily deceived. He's not distracted. Now, he knows the good, and I love this. This is not just a negative connotation. Jesus said this, that, that if you do things in secret, pray and give, that your Father which seeth in secret. He's not distracted. Word you openly. He does know the bad but God is not distracted. He's not a distracted God. He's not unaware. Not only do I notice that he's not distracted, number two, notice tonight as we look at verse number four, that the God of heaven is not disturbed. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. In the midst of what was going on in this unnamed nation, but described nation, in the midst of what was going to happen in this judgment, God says, clear to his servant, but notice and, and write this down and observe this, I will take my rest. Or God says, I will sit down in my chair. I'm paraphrasing. God says, in all of this calamity, this, this nation that was terrible from the beginning, that is obstinate, I will sit down and take my rest. 
like he's not even bothered, like he's not even panicking about what is happening. That he knows because of his power and because of that he does all things at the counsel of his own will, that though people down here may try to undermine and, and resist and rebel against God, God has the ability to not be anxious. My friends, this is a powerful truth. He's still taking the rest that he needs in these things. Think about Lazarus. Lazarus dies, and Jesus does not panic. Jesus does not order an Uber. Jesus takes his ever-loving time. So much so that the people there, Mary and Martha and the others, were like, God, what have you done? If you had gotten here sooner, if you had become concerned, if you had panicked, if you'd gotten in a rush, if you had put some, some, some fire under that, then you would have been able to solve this. But because you didn't see the urgency of the situation, Jesus, this is what they're saying, because you did not feel the urgency of the problem, you have blown it, because now Lazarus is dead. And Jesus, even with that accusation, was still not anxious. Jesus still did not panic and say, oh my goodness, you're right, I didn't understand that. Wow. He merely instructs and says, simple children, you don't understand me. Because there's this little thing called the resurrection. And he said, and then they, they respond back, of course, the last day there'll be resurrection. No, Jesus, no, no, you don't understand. Let me demonstrate. Lazarus, come forth. And the same character that Jesus displayed is the same character here where God says, I will take my rest. Now, this is why this is good for us. You ever get worked up about life? Come on. You ever get worked up about your life? It's not working out right. It's not being solved quick enough. And you have a panic. You're anxious. You're concerned. You're lighting a fire under your backside. You're like, listen, we got to solve this. And you're praying like God needs to hurry up. You with me? And he doesn't. And instead of remembering that God, <laughs> that God will not be disturbed, we think, we mistakenly start to think, but God doesn't care. No, my friends, God doesn't panic. And even when it's not a problem, even when it's a holy problem, if you ever looked around this culture, I'm talking about U.S. culture, you look at politics, you look at laws, you look at how people are living and what they're doing with, with marriage, what they're doing with, with boys and girls, and you get worked up in a holy sense. You're like, God, you need to make this right. Lord, we need revival right now. And if we're not careful, we think, God, I care about this more than you care about this. I'm more worked up than you are. It would do us well to remember that God is not disturbed. Now, I don't know why God took his rest right here. And I don't know why God takes his rest in 2024. I know if you or I are in charge, we would solve a few things just like that. And we would also make a mess of things just like that. But God in his wisdom, we understand him and his character. My friends, as we understand God, then we can rest in his power. See, this is where it helps you and me. So the next time you're, you're tempted to be anxious, remember that you only choose to be anxious when God is anxious. The next time that you're starting to panic a little bit, just remember, God, I will only choose to panic when you panic. It's like if you see the bomb squad defusing a bomb. If you see them running, you better run. And when you see God running, you better run. But if God, if God is not disturbed, my friend, then why should we be disturbed? See, this prophecy de declares to us the character of God. And number three, look in verse seven. In that time 
shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from the beginning, hitherto a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. If you were to take the time, we won't. You could compare verse number two to verse number seven. They are virtually identical in their description of who is doing this, with one major difference, beginning of the verse. And that beginning of the verse is our truth of the character of God. That not only will the God of heaven, is he not distracted, and will he not be disturbed, the God of heaven will not be demeaned forever. Because what this verse says is, in that time that this people, and he was very clear to say it's the same people I referred back in verse number two is coming under judgment, not different people, the same people, the nation that is peeled and scattered, scattered and peeled, and is terrible from the beginning, that will be trodden down and will be judged, that people will bring a present to the Lord, to the Lord of hosts. Like when this is done, God will be glorified. And this nation apparently has turned their back on God and has refused to follow God. And it said, we don't want anything to do with God. But God says, ultimately, I will be glorified. My friends, we know this from Scripture that at some point, God will make everything right. At some point, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. At that day, there will be no mockery of the Last Supper. There will be no mockery of God and his truth. There will be no mockery of creation. And the God is, there will be no discussion whether God created heaven and the earth. It will be settled. There will be no discussion whether marriage is between a man and a woman or if he only made male and female, or whether he made 60 or 70 different, different genders, there will be no discussion that day. There will be no rebellion that day. There will be nothing except glorifying of God from everyone. The glory of God, the God of heaven, will not be demeaned forever. See, sometimes I, and probably many of you, just feel that holy irreverence and it just works us up. How could they mock a holy... God, just strike them down. God could display himself so powerfully just like, right? Just like that. With such a display, yet he was so patient in the Old Testament. He was so patient on the cross. The Bible says he's so patient in the future that we must remember that the God of heaven, the God we claim to serve, will not be demeaned forever. In creation, God was glorified. With the institution of the the family, God was glorified. The children of Israel, God was glorified. With salvation, God is glorified. And in my life, I want to choose to glorify God now. Paul said this way, for me to live is Christ. Not to glorify me, my work ethic, my character, my wisdom, my strength of hands, my compassion. For me to live is not for my success or my gain or my fame. For me to live is not for my family. For me to live is not for my own ideas, for my own philosophy. For me to live is not for me to finally have the time to sit down on the weekend and relax. For me to live is not to go on vacation. For me to live is not to have the retirement that I want. For me to live is not to see anything in my life be successful. For me to live ought to be Christ. And to die, I just get to see my Savior. And so, tonight, how well do you know God? Do you understand that the God of heaven's not distracted? Have you been discouraged in well doing? God sees it. Have you been deceived in sin? God sees it. How well do you know God? Have you been panicking when the God of heaven? is not panicking. Have you been worked up when the God of heaven is taking his rest? 
And have you been glorifying God? How we view God will determine how we live for God. To know that he sees, that he cares, that he receives a glory ought to influence us to live for him.